welcome uh, to the Hot Zone. We have got the extraordinary actor, Joseph Sakura from Power. Hey, how you doing, buddy? Hey, I'm doing great. Good to be here. Good, good. Welcome and thank you for joining us, man. You know, this coronavirus pandemic is, it's just crazy, man, what's, what's going on here um, in the nation, of course, in New York. How are you holding up? How are you doing? Are you healthy? Do, do you feel good? Yeah, my wife and I have been um, self-quarantining for, this is our fifth week. And um, we're in not super tight quarters, uh, but we're in, you know, it's, you get a little bit cabin fever, so we go out for walks. But we're being really responsible. And I think that New York is, a, what I've seen is about 50-50 of people that wear masks, social distance, uh, try to keep everybody else around them healthy. And then 50% um, that really don't, I don't know if they don't care, if they think they're immune, if they don't realize that they can be uh, carriers and, and give it to uh, the elderly or people at risk. So I don't, I don't really know what's going on here with a ton of people. I see you outside and I shouldn't. You should be indoors. This thing is serious and it is not a joke. You can feed your PBS documentary addiction like me or maybe catch all six seasons of Power on Stars. The younger generation primarily, which is why when I worked with the governor's office to put that PSA about, about stay at home and keep your distance, one of the main reasons that I was talking to the younger people is there is, and I was like that too, a little bit more of like the invincibility factor. I'm invincible, I'm young, nothing's gonna happen to me. And that may be true because uh, it's been shown that even though people, uh, younger people have been affected, they often, not always, but often get affected less. But part of it is that it's not about you you might be okay, but it's about the people that you could be infecting. Your grandfather, your grandmother, uh, the lady down the street, somebody who you don't realize you're affecting. It's about a, it's a selfishness rather than a selflessness that you need to social distance to help eradicate a problem. We don't talk politics on, the, on this show, but I'm just curious about your take on how you think uh, President Trump has handled this pandemic so far. I think he's doing. I think he's doing what he can right now. Um, he just lives in. I always. I always just feel about Trump that he lives in a different world than me. Right. Like when I hear him talking or anything, I'm just like, what is he talking? About? Right. I'm proud of uh, Cuomo's leadership. I always find that when Cuomo is in a, in um, a strong position, he does really well. I think that when he's questioned, he doesn't do all that great. If like, if not everybody's on Cuomo's side, Cuomo is gonna you know, do a lot of huffing and puffing, but the guy's a, a good leader when it breaks it down. And I'm really proud of the work that he's doing. So, um, you know, I'm really, I'm really proud to work with Cuomo in any capacity that I can do to help because I think he's doing a fantastic job at being a leader right now when we need him. I've been supporting um, the Actors Fund, um, also uh, the, the uh, Food Bank of New York City, just important things that are uh, important for all of us to get back to some sort of normalcy when that time comes. So you're self-quarantining with your wife and practicing show, social distancing, which which is great. Which one of you are getting in each other's nerves the most? Is anybody getting each other's nerves or are you guys I'm, is I'm all getting love? On her nerves. I'm getting on her nerves. My wife <laughs> is very I'm, I'm the one getting on her nerves, if anything, for sure. But um, she's, she's wonderful and my wife is, uh, uh, She's very um, accommodating in so many ways to me. Like if I have to do this interview, like right now she's in the kitchen cooking herself. So she's like, I'm trying, and I can hear her trying to be very quiet. <laughs> I'm asking who's doing the cooking. I think yeah. you're doing the eating and she's doing the cooking, right? I think so. Why does it look, does it show in a little bit? <laughs> well, but we're working out, we're exercising together every day. We're doing right. a hit class every day. And, uh, and then not uh, Sunday, Sundays is our day to just relax. But uh, we do five days a week of hit class. And then on a Saturday, we do an hour long uh, yoga session. Hey, Tommy. Coast. Hey, man. Oh my God. Hey. I just saw Dre outside. Did he do this? No. G give me your hand, come uh, on. Uh, oh, fuck. You're gonna be all right, brother. You're gonna be all right. You hang in there for me, all right? Come on, you've been through worse than this. I don't know about this time. Yeah, this time. Uh, this time. The chemistry that you and Omari Hardwick, who played Ghost, obviously, mm -hmm. had on screen was amazing. Yeah, that was, that yeah. was big. It was really, really big. And you guys did a great job uh, together as partners. How did you guys build that brotherhood and that, uh, that strong on-screen chemistry together? It was originally going to be 50 Cent who was going to be Ghost. Oh, really? Um, I even yeah. Oh, okay. Yep. okay. Originally, it was going to be 50. And then because of uh, how intense the not only the rehearsals, but the shooting schedule would be, he didn't want 
to put in all of that time, executive produce and star and write his music and tour. They reached out to Omari and they offered him the role. Uh, of Ghost, and then after they offered it to him, they needed to build the cast around him. So oh. that's when we started doing chemistry reads with Omari, and Omari and I just, uh, uh, we had a great chemistry, and we put in the time together. We drove around Southside Jamaica, Queens before we started, and looked at the streets where our characters were supposed to be from, and uh, made up our history um, with each other, and, and we, we put it, and we made decisions. Even if the writers conflicted with the decisions we had made for our characters before it was important that we had that history behind our eyes okay. and had that time where we were in where we were in sync with each other and I think that that spoke volumes for uh, the brotherhood and Courtney often says that power is a tragic love story but it's a tragic love story between two brothers how's it working with 50 Fantastic. He's the most accessible boss. He's the only boss I've ever had in my life that as soon as he, he met me for the first time he gave me a hug Oh, okay. You know what I mean? He was just like, you're my guy. I believe in you. And he was accessible. And, and anytime I had a question about how something might go down, um, I'm like, hey, Fifth, you know, if my guy's doing this and this guy's doing, what do you think? You know what I mean? Using him as a resource. And so he was always accessible to us if we utilized him in that way. And I always did. And plus, I like the guy. And yeah, I was a fan. Yeah, yeah he's, he's a great guy. guy. And, and I was a fan beforehand. So it was nice that he was just cool. Yeah, yeah, he's definitely real. Don't mess with him, though, because don't go borrow no money from him because he's going he gonna to get at you on social media and blow you up. <laughs> no, sir. Yeah, I don't want any of that smart. <laughs> but you're good now, so you don't got to worry about that. <laughs> so, but speak to me about uh, Tommy in terms of he's a bad man. He's ruthless, and he's a, a drug dealer. He kills people. He's, you know, but everybody loves him. He's like because a he's, horrible because he's, guy. Because he's kind to people that deserve kindness, because he's loyal in the face of adversity, because he holds himself up to a code that he's committed himself to, and he expects other people to hold themselves to as well. So I think that there's a yin and a yang, and it's a fully actualized character, a 360 degree view of this person. And I think that we're able to see ourselves in Tommy's flaws and his accomplishments. Tommy was my breakout role in a lot of ways because it's a role that could have slipped through the cracks. It could have been played one dimensionally, you know, could have just been this ferocious, you know, blah, blah, blah. But to humanize that character is, was, is the real trick of it. And which is what I've tried to do to all of my characters, but I'm not necessarily with like, I don't, I'm not like, you know, a gorgeous dude like Brad Pitt or something like that. And I'm not necessarily good looking just dude. Like, You're a good looking dude, man. I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> my, I, my, like my manager said, and people will love this part. My manager, this is before power. She goes, okay, let's be honest. You're a seven, but you're sexy as a 10. <laughs> <laughs> the big question we all want to know now is about your power spinoff. When yeah. do you expect that? When is it coming? That's what everybody wants to know. Well, the writers are uh, deep. They're writing. And because the pandemic happened when they did, the writers smoothly transitioned because the writers room hadn't been open very long before the pandemic hit. Because yeah. uh, the Tommy uh, show was the last one to go for whatever reason. And then, but the writers, which was actually a, a, a happy accident, that the writers have, like how me and you are talking right now, this is what the writers do every day. And they work for eight hour days every day. So they're, they're, they're developing these characters. They're gonna breeze through these scripts. And hopefully by the time uh, we're ready, uh, we'll see how far uh, uh, along the Tommy uh, development of the story is. And we'll watch Tommy uh, try to get his ass out to Los Angeles. Exactly, <laughs> all to LA. So I would, say, I would say in a practical way, you, yeah. you wouldn't expect anything until next year. But yeah. um, I, think, I think it's gonna be, I think it's gonna be fresh and served up hot. I think it's going to be a I think it's going to be a standalone show that's going to be uh, really something special. Now everyone also is interested in Ozark, all right? Yeah, great show. Third season of uh, Ozark on Netflix. It's a great show and you play uh, Frank Cosgrove Jr. Tell us right. a little bit about the show and about your character. Um, well, I mean, I really had a great time being on the show because I was a fan of the show. Um, and so uh, it's funny, people always think like I was just offered this role of Frank Jr. Um, I don't think the casting director really even knew what, I mean, barely knew. I don't think she probably watched an episode of Power ever. Um, and, <laughs> now, oh, wow, that's surprising. <laughs> yeah, so I, 
you know, um, I auditioned for that role just like everybody else did. Um, I sat in a line and signed my name in on the sign-in sheet, and then I auditioned for the role. Obviously, Frank Jr., he was shot in the groin. So we don't know what's going on, whether you're still, is the character still alive? You know, we don't know. Will Frank Jr. be back in season four? He, he might be. He might be. Might be. I don't know. I guess we'll, I guess we'll see. We got to watch and see. Hey, they had a couple of people without dick and balls on Game of Thrones. It didn't seem to hurt too much. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> you know what I mean? What's up, everybody? I'm Joseph Sikora, and I'm in the hot zone. <laughs>